Hey family, Pastor Darius here, man. And as always, I'm always excited to share God's word with you. I'm super passionate about it. Hopefully you feel that. Um, if you're familiar with this teaching ministry, this word changed my life. And not like God's word literally changed my life. I'm in love with him and I'm in love with his word. And so I preach from that place. And so what I'm sharing with you today is a message that I think is, I pray it brings you some of the greatest liberation and freedom you've ever had in practicing your religion. I really do. Um, it's a message called, I'm about to cook, and I believe it's gonna really change the game. If you are blessed by it, just, I got one request, share it with somebody else. All right, take care, enjoy the message. I wanna, I wanna get into the word today. We got baptisms today, y'all, so I wanna get, I want to get right to it. I got a word I want to get us in. And, and, and so there's a word found in John chapter number 21, beginning at verse number seven. It says, then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. And as soon as Peter heard him say this, um, he, as soon as Peter heard him say, it's the Lord, he wrapped the outer garment around him for he had taken it off and he jumped into the water. The other disciples followed the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. And when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you just caught. So Peter climbed back into the boat, dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even so, even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. I want to stop right there, and I want to talk from this subject in our time together. This is your declaration for 2024. I'm about to cook. <laughs> I'm about to cook. Family, we just exited out of the holiday season, and it is a season that is saturated with fellowshipping, with fraternizing, with friends and family. And some of that fellowshipping and fraternizing is around fun, but a lot of that fellowship and fraternizing is also around food. And if many individuals would be objective and honest, they would have to admit they take the food just as serious, <laughs> or in some cases, more seriously than the fraternizing, the fellowshipping, and the fun. There are some particular people with a certain type of eating personality that impacts the way they engage with others when they step into an environment where food is being served. They step into the space and they exchange pleasantries with the people that are in that space and they make their way to the room where the food is being displayed and they engage in an examination of the food. Mm-hmm, I see that, okay, I see that. I'm gonna tear that up right there. I'm tearing that up. What is that? Okay, I'm going to tell you that. And, and oftentimes an individual is engaging in observation and they stop at a certain dish that looks a bit ambiguous. And so they step back and they gaze and scan the room for someone that they can trust that is a safe place for what they're about to release. And, and they say, come over here. And then that individual makes their way into their proximity and they ask them the quintessential question. It is the quintessential question that people ask when it comes to certain dishes. Who cooked this? Let me go to this side over here. <laughs> Who cooked this? And the answer to that question either eases your anxiety, okay, we're good, or it increases your anxiety, I don't know. <laughs> but this reality naturally is a revelation for us spiritually because the truth of the matter is this, naturally and spiritually, the issue isn't always whether or not the food is cooked. 
It's how the food is cooked. And how the food is cooked often determines whether or not I'm able and I'm willing to eat the food. And if we don't understand how to arrange cooking in a way that it appeals to our spiritual appetite, we will spend our spiritual lives malnourished, not because we don't have access to cook food, but because the food isn't cooked in a way that makes it edible for us. And this particular passage here in John is a powerful picture of what I'm preaching about. I love Bible stories. I love Bible narratives. You see me using a lot of Bible stories. And here's what the Bible says about Bible stories. Paul says that those things that are written aforetime are written for our learning. That we might, through patience of the scriptures, have hope. It means that God shows me what happened with people like Abraham and Sarah. Not to just show me what happened with Abraham and Sarah, but to show me what in principle can happen for me. Are you here? He's not showing me what happened with Abraham and Sarah so I know their business. He's showing me what happened with Abraham and Sarah to show me how he can handle my business. And he says things like, I am not a respecter of persons. I'm a God of principle. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So, so for example, Sarah and Abraham having a baby at an old age in the Bible isn't to say literally everybody who's older should try to have a baby. The principle God wants us to pull from passages like that is something along these lines. Abraham and Sarah show us, watch me, that God is able to empower you to give birth to a thing in a season where other people think you miss your window. Okay. So if you have properly stewarded every season, be quiet. If you've never made a mistake that's cost you time, be quiet. If you've never mismanaged an opportunity, be quiet. But if you feel like there are some seasons you mismanaged, some opportunities you squandered, and some do-overs you wish you could have, you need to know that we serve a God that can do it now. He's sovereign, which means that he has the last say. He has ultimate rule and authority, and two things can't be sovereign at the same time. Either time is in charge or God is in charge, but both of them can't be in charge. And I want to talk to some people who feel like it's too late, you made too many mistakes, or you're too old. Let me say it the way they said it at the Mount Olive Missionary Baptist Church in Kilmichael, Mississippi. The devil is a liar. He can do it now. In this season, he can do it now. After the mishaps, after the mistakes, after the setbacks, he can do it now. That's why that's in the Bible. The Red Sea is not in the Bible for us to go literally stand in front of ponds. It's showing you that it does not, don't you mess with me today. It is showing you that it does not matter what stands between you and the place God promised to take you. It means God will engage in whatever activity he needs to engage in to get you through it. So if he's got to make water do something that it doesn't normally do to get you through, he'll make water do it, he'll make a supervisor do it, he'll make a sponsor do it, he'll make a hater do it. When God gets ready, These stories are written, Paul says, for our learning. And so stories like this with Peter are written for our learning. This text exposes us to an incident in in the life of an individual who is an apprentice, a mentee of Jesus, a disciple of Jesus, and his name is Peter. And we get exposed to an area of Peter's life Watch this, that to me, I would be uncomfortable having exposed. 
See, this is why you have to be careful when you say, God, use me. Because when I say, let me, can I just be honest? Can I just be me? When I say God use me, what I really want God to use is my gifts. Use my gifts, use my talent, use my ability. But when God uses us, he uses our gifts. But in addition to using our gifts, he uses our life. Now using my gifts, I enjoy that part. Using my life, I don't enjoy that part. Because when he lose, use your life, it means that sometimes like Lazarus, he may let you lay in a tomb three days. And then on the fourth day, raise you up because he says, me using your gifts is one thing. Me using your life is another. When I use your life, I let you have a setback and then draw an audience and then I arrange a comeback. So that the same people that had to watch you during your season of setback are the same people that I make watch you during your season of comeback. So I can show them not how strong you are, but how good I am. And don't look at anybody, but I just want you to say it so those around you can hear it. Keep watching. Yeah, yeah. Yep, because if you stop watching me on Friday, you're going to miss my resurrection on Sunday. Yeah. You talking, but keep on talking because I'm going to give you something else to talk about. And I want you to talk just as loud about my resurrection as you did with my crucifixion. I'm getting ready to give you something to talk about. You want something to talk about. I'm getting ready to give you something to talk about. Watch this bounce back. Talk about that. Watch this recovery. Talk about that. Watch what I'm getting ready to start and launch and birth and scale in 2024. Talk about that. Only 40 and over gonna feel this run tail that. Since you... Here, God is using Peter's life. This text is, 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 is uncomfortable, it's vulnerable. He's exposing his humanity. And it's not that we don't trust God with our humanity. We don't trust people with it. And so we get exposed to Peter who's in a season where he's suffering from mismanaged disappointment. Now he's dealing with disappointment. That doesn't mean he's weak. That means he's human. Because everybody deals with disappointment. The question isn't if we deal with it. The question is how we deal with it. Come on. Do we deal with it productively? Or do we deal with it destructively? Because even if I don't want to deal with it, if I got to deal with it, I got to deal with it. And he's dealing with disappointment. Disappointment in who, Pastor? I don't know if y'all can handle this. First of all, disappointment in God. Yep, he had this expectation that something that would live would live when the thing he wanted to live died. Who are you talking about? Jesus. He was so adamantly against Jesus' death, even when Jesus spoke about the inevitability of his death, Peter rebuked Jesus. Don't you talk like that, Jesus. And Jesus had to rebuke Peter. He said, now wait a minute now. <laughs> he said, get, get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense to the things of God. He was believing for something to live that died. Have you ever? I know it's one thing when people say you didn't have faith, but it's another thing when you know you had faith and you may not have even had the amount of faith that you wanted, but the Bible says it doesn't take big faith to do big things. Jesus said, all I need is faith the size of a mustard seed and mustard seed faith can move mountains. And many of us know there were seasons in our life where we at least had mustard seed faith. I'm not saying PD, I had the most faith in the world, but I had mustard seed. Have you ever 
believe for something to live that you watch die. Watch the vision die. Watch the dream die. Watch the business die. Watch the ministry die. Watch the relationship die. And you had faith. And when something that you wanted to live dies, it affects your faith. Where my honest people at here? It's, I mean, come on. When you were confident and bold and convinced and convicted, and then when all that confidence and all that conviction manifests itself in something that you wanted to live, dying, it'll shake that faith a little bit. This is what I call faith trauma. It's a result of disturbing, a disturbing and disappointing experience in the past that affects your ability to believe big in the future. It's not that I don't believe, I just believe with boundaries. This is what I call safe faith. I believe for the unlikely, not the impossible. Because the unlikely is safe. The unlikely keeps me from being disappointed. The unlikely is actually a comp could, could be accomplished with just a little bit of God's help. If I just work hard enough and God just helped me a little bit, I can accomplish that. Safe. Peter is suffering from this. Pastor Darius, what, what, what else is he suffering from? Not just disappointment in God, but also disappointment in himself. What do you mean? Because prior to Jesus' death, Peter had made all these promises. He looking at Jesus saying, I'm a real one. I don't know about all these other ones. But when it all shake out, I'm going to be here. I'm with you. I'm riding with you. I'm ride or die. Jesus said, man, please. Before this rooster crows in the morning, you will have denied me three times. Peter like, please. I mean, he talking heavy. He talking, this big Peter, not the little one. This, this, he talking, he talking spicy. Jesus said, man, please. And before that rooster crow the next morning, three times he denied Jesus. So he's not just disappointed in God. He's disappointed in him. Have you ever been disappointed in you? When you've made promises to yourself, never again. This was the last time I take that. This is the last time I accept that. This is the last time I do that. This is the last time I allow that. Have you ever made promises to yourself and had to look yourself in the mirror and tell yourself off? Let me go to this side over here. I want to talk to some people that are honest enough to say, I've had to tell myself off sometimes and just look in the mirror and say, you're just gullible. That's what you are. You're just weak. That's what you are. You just fall for anything. That's what you are. He's disappointed in himself. And I say this disappointment is mismanaged because it's mismanaged in his activity. While the text says in John 21, 3, G Peter says, I'm going out to fish. See, let me tell you why this is significant. It's significant because Peter says, I'm going out to fish. I'm going back to fishing. Because when Jesus calls Peter, he calls him out of fishing. This is what he was doing prior to meeting Jesus. And Jesus said, I want you to follow me because from this time forth, I'll make you a fisher of men. So not literally, but metaphorically, what this can represent for you and I is how mismanaged disappointment will drive you back to what he called you out of. 
It's like, well, if all of this stuff ain't working out, I might as well go back to doing what I was doing before. Why am I even trying? Why am I even putting forth the effort? Where is the honest section in here today? Why am I even going through all of this if these are the results? Okay, maybe that's not it. So let me try this. I know what service I'm at. I know what service. Maybe it doesn't drive you back to what he called you out of. Maybe it draws you back to who he called you away from. That's it. Okay. <laughs> Come on here. Yeah, because what happens is the pain that you experience in the present will often cause you to minimize the pain you experience in the past. And so you have this sense of demonic and diabolical amnesia where you really forget how bad that was. But you are so hurt in the present, you start explaining away that pain in the past. And you're like, well, it kind of, it wasn't that bad. They weren't that bad. No, they had you up all night. They were on your nerves. You had to pray for God to set you free and to break the soul tie. And when God finally got you free, pain drove you back don't I hear the Holy Spirit don't send that text some of them you don't need to send come here and others you don't need to receive I don't have a daughter I have I have God daughters one of my Closest things to a, to a brother. He passed away in 2019, October 31st. He looked at me as he was dying. His two girls walked in the hospital. Me and my wife brought his two girls in the hospital um, room as he was dying. And he looked at me. He had walked with me in ministry for 14 years. The closest thing I ever had to a brother. My number two. I trusted him like Potiphar trusted Joseph. I trusted him like Potiphar tr trusted Joseph. He was very clear. It was like a Barnabas and Paul relationship. He was clear. I'm called to you. He wrote a whole book called The Two Man. And he, would look at, he looked at me one day. He said, I'm not Joshua. I'm Joseph. Joshua was Moses' successor. I'm not taking your place. When you done, I'm done. That's what he told me. So he's dying and he brings his two girls in the room and he looks at me and Shamika, he said, he said, take care of my girls. And then he looked at me, he said, you got them? I said, I got them. Yeah. And he said, show them the world. I said, I got them. Yeah. So those, though I don't have biological daughters, but those are my, those are my, until, until one of us go to heaven. I got them. Yes, now, so I, I don't have, so there are things that I, as a man and as a pastor, would say uh, to daughters naturally, but I'm going to say it to the house spiritually. And this is, this is important now. Y'all okay? Because it's some stuff you need. I even did a video. I think I did a seri series of videos one time, like four things I tell my daughters. Okay, so if, if I was adding a fifth video, this is what I would say. I would say men don't really break up. They take breaks. They will break it off or you will break it off. They will spin the block with a text like y'all just talked last week. Let me go to this side over here. It's like, wait a minute. I am 40 years old. The last time I talked to you was the high school prom and somehow you got my number and sent a what you doing text. It's been 20 years. Who are you? It's quiet in this Episcopalian church. He goes back to fishing. Here's what's scary. It says, the text says, he goes back to fishing. He told them, and they said, we'll go with you. This is scary, because Marlon, what it suggests is sometimes we can see company as confirmation that we're doing the right thing. We can see, we can think their company is God's confirmation. We can assume that their agreement is God's endorsement. But the text says they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. 
because it doesn't matter who go with you if God don't. It doesn't matter who's in the network if God isn't. It doesn't matter who's endorsing it if God isn't. It doesn't matter who's behind it if God, because you can have all of them and none of him and catch nothing. But you can have one of him and none of them and catch everything. And let me see if I got any old school gospel music listeners that will go with me here. As long as I got King Jesus. They catch nothing. And the text says, while they're out in the sea, somebody's standing on the shore. And he say, friends, did y'all catch anything? They don't know it's Jesus. I don't know if it's the distance or the disappointment that's altered their view. Because time, sometimes when you're disappointed, it gets in the way of you seeing God. Yeah. Said, so, did you catch anything? They said, no, we didn't catch anything. So they still don't know it's Jesus. He says, all right, take the net and cast it on the right side of the boat. So they take the net and they cast it on the right side of the boat and they come up with a net full of fish. All night they tried to fish and caught nothing. But they got a word from God and the word wasn't change the pond. The word wasn't switch the boat. The word wasn't change the net. The word was throw the net on the right side of the boat. I'm going to show you how to win where you are. Y'all better come get me today. Just because you haven't been winning there doesn't mean you can't win there. God will show you how to throw your net on the right side of the boat. And they come up with a bunch of fish and the text says, the one whom Jesus loved, that's John, said, it's the Lord. And then Peter said, it's the Lord. And Peter jumps in the water to try to swim to where Jesus is. They said, it's the Lord after the net was filled with fish, which means they didn't quite know it was the Lord when they dropped the net. Because sometimes you really don't know if it's God until after the net's full. So it takes faith to do it right, but it also takes faith sometimes to to make sure you heard right. So here's what I'm saying. Are y'all ready for this? Are y'all ready for this? God gives you the clarity you need to take action, not the amount of clarity you want to feel comfortable. Are y'all going to talk back to me? In this church, I said, God gives the amount of clarity you need to take action. He doesn't give you the amount of clarity you want to feel comfortable. Because sometimes when it comes to God's instruction, you and I want detail. But God's instruction, when we, even when we look at um, Old Testament with Abraham, New Testament with Jesus in the wedding, of, in the wedding at Cana of Galilee, uh, Galilee, what you'll see is God's instruction is characterized by two traits. There are parts of it that are specific, then there are parts of it that are vague. Abraham, get thee away from thy family, get thee out of thy country, thy kindred. Specific. Where am I going? To a land I'm going to show you. Vague. Leave them and leave there. Specific. Where? I'm not talking to you about that yet. <laughs> wedding at Cana of Galilee. Jesus' mother said to the servants at that wedding, whatever he tell you to do. And I don't know what that is. But whatever he tell you to do, do it. Sometimes you got to throw the net and you don't have 100% clarity. Sometimes God's like, I gave you 51 that's enough to take action. But I got to believe that even if I miss it, that if my motives are right, 
God will honor the intent of my motives. Come on here. They throw this net. It's so much fish. Peter swims the shore and the Bible says he gets to the shore and he sees Jesus cooking. What's Jesus doing? Cooking. What's Jesus doing? Cooking. What's Jesus doing? Cooking. And Jesus said to them, he says, bring me some of the fish you caught. Here's the issue. Y'all ready for this? Because most people want a net full of fish. But they won't give Jesus some when he asks. <laughs> Did you hear what I just said? I want you to notice Jesus' language. He didn't say, bring me some of the fish you caught because I told you where to cast your net. He says, I'm putting the responsibility on you to remember my contribution to your success. <laughs> Did you hear what I just... He said, he said, he said I'm just going to tell you, bring me some of the fish that you caught. But just in case, we think we caught it because of our skill. Remember, you caught it because I showed you what side of the boat to cast your net upon. And just like, not only did I tell you what to do, I spoke it when you were able to hear it. Because I could have showed up on the shore at night. And I could have told you to cast your net on the right side of the boat at night. But I waited till you had fished all night and caught nothing. Because sometimes when you have empty efforts, that's when you got an open mind. God, why didn't you say this sooner? Your mind wasn't open. If I were to talk to you on the front end because you are a fisherman and you've been fishing for the majority of your life, you assume you know how to do this. And so you rarely consult me when it comes to things that you know how to do. So I'm going to let you, let you extend all your energy, all your effort, utilize all your acumen, and then when you come up empty, I'm going to say, now you ready to talk? I'm going to let you try all of these paths and go in all of this direction and then we're going to sit down and say, now you ready for me to tell you what you're supposed to be doing in this season? Have you got that out of your system? Are you ready to listen? I'm done, Tario. Here it is. Here it is, church. He says, bring me some of that fish come and nourish and the Bible says he cooks it and then he says these words let's have breakfast he says come and nourish yourself because what's waiting on you in the future requires nourishment did you hear what I just said he said we're getting ready to have a destiny conversation because this time when I pull you off this boat you're not going back Did you hear what I just said? He said, you've been able to get this far in your journey without being as nourished as you need to be spiritually. But where I'm getting ready to take you is going to require you to be spiritually full because you've made money being malnourished. You've made a family being malnourished. You've made a career being malnourished, but you cannot accomplish destiny being malnourished. And I'm getting ready to have a destiny conversation with you. Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Your purpose is going to require you being full. So you can't go past this stage without being full. So come, let's have breakfast. Breakfast. Jesus is cooking. He is teaching them that you have to take responsibility for your nourishment. Did you hear what I just said? Yeah, I'm cooking now, but I'm getting ready to go to the Father. And you're going to have to cook for yourself. Yee. Did you hear what I just said? It represents taking intentionality and, and taking engaging intentionality and taking responsibility for my spiritual nourishment. And what happens with many people is that you've delegated your cooking. And the only time you eat is when church cooks. (laughs) 
I don't have my glasses. I'm trying. That, that you've, you've delegated the responsibility to nourishing yourself to the preacher. And it's not that they aren't supposed to supplement, but they are not a substitute for your own cooking. Because certain things have to be cooked a certain way. Like food, we might call it temperature. Spiritually, we call it your spiritual temperament. And only know, only you know how you make your mac and cheese. And why are you mad at somebody for not cooking it the way you like it? Go cook it yourself. You got to cook it yourself. Did you hear what I just said? So you have a spiritual temperament, guys, that determines how stuff needs to be cooked for you. And you can't put all that responsibility on any other individual or any other organization. They play a role. They are necessary. They are part of God's plan. But they are supplements, not substitutes for your own cooking. I'm done telling you, so for me, for me, some, well, put some people like prayer cooked a certain way. Some people like worship, right? Some people like prayer hot. Jesus. E-D-D-I-E, Eddie. I'm coming in a Honda. Kawasaki Mitsubishi. Some people like it hot. And some people like it cold. Not cold in the sense of apathy, but reflective. Contemplative. And what happens is, you can give. Now, if, if you're not getting what you're supposed to get from a church, that's different. But what can happen is people can get frustrated because a church that has to cook for everybody doesn't cook everything their way. So like when it comes to, when it comes to uh, worship, I'm full every week. Because I hadn't delegated all my worship to what's happening on the platform. And when you do, you get frustrated when a worship team not singing your songs. I wish they would sing more of these songs. That's your temperament. Somebody over here has another temperament. Did you hear what I just said? But if you're cooking yourself, you don't come to church to just to worship. You're worshiping on your way. There are some people that say, I didn't worship when I walked in here. I worship on the way here. I entered into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise because I know what connects with me. So I'm, I'm reflective, I'm contemplative. I want to sit with him. And I'll sit with him tomorrow. And I'll sit with him Tuesday. And I will sit with him Wednesday. And I will sit with him Thursday. Because I know I can't delegate my cooking. You've got a spiritual temperament. And you have to cook according to that temperament. There are nine of them. We created an assessment and a spiritual growth plan that's customized for every temperament. Today I'm going to give you five real quick because i got to dismiss. we got to do baptism. But some of you are what's called naturalists. You don't connect with God through nature. You connect with God in nature. Amen. It means a tree, not God. The ground isn't God. But the trees and creation remind you of the glory and the grandeur of your God. Is what Jesus says in Matthew 6 when he says, look at the sparrows, look at the, the, the birds. He says, they don't have a barn to store their food in, yet your heavenly father takes care of them. He says, consider the lilies of the field. Look at the grass. God takes care of them. How much more 
will he take care of you? So that means if you're this person, you shouldn't feel weak because you don't pray in a closet. You pray in a park. And because God's omnipresent, he'll show up in the park. Y'all better come get me. He'll show up on your run. Woo. People think you're raising your hands, stretching. They have no idea you're raising your hands, worshiping. Moses saw burning bushes, but he never worshiped the bush. Some of us are not natural. Some of us are sensates. What's this? This is an individual that connects with God through experiences. This is a person who, who desires to sense, to feel, to be enveloped in the presence of God. We know God is omnipresent, meaning everywhere. But this person wants what's called, the Hebrew word for it is Shekinah, Kabat. They want manifest presence. It's glory. I know you here, but I want you to appeal to my senses so I can feel you. David said, in, my, in your presence, there's fullness of joy. So I need to sense him. Then there are others who are, who are not, since they, maybe this person is an intellectual, this is a person who connects with God through elevated thinking. It is mean as your mind is filled with truths, your heart is warm for the Father that a revelation of truth makes you want to worship. I'm like that. See, you can't force me. You can't fuss me or force me into it. But when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me, his word warms my heart. So whereas the sensate might be into the mood and the melody of a song, the intellectual is into the lyrics. Not saying one is not into the lyrics, but the lyrics land differently for this person. So some people just singing, all my life you've been faithful, and they're just going through it. The intellectual can't get through it. All my life, wait a minute. I just did a Sanford and Son. All my life, young, old, Good, bad, up, down, all my life, you've been, you've been faithful. And then some are the enthusiast. This is the individual who connects with God through enthusiastic celebration. That their enthusiasm isn't always an act. It isn't always uh, a desire for attention that some people really connect with God, like David, who danced out of his kingly garments in 2 Samuel 6. That was his way of connecting. His passion for the Father creates a degree of enthusiasm where he connects deeply. And then last but not least is the traditionalist. This isn't a Pharisee who worships tradition. This is one who connects with God through ritual and symbol. When they see a cross, they see more than a cross. They see a cross and they say, at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burdens of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight and now I'm happy all the day. See, this, this, this is what happens. If, if you have what we would call contemporary expressions of worship, don't minimize people who connect through ritual and symbol because many of them had a spirituality that was so deep that it allowed them to overcome social realities that most of us couldn't. They got sprayed with a water hose and then worship Sunday. We'd be throwing fits with God. Some of us will be questioning our relationship with God. They sat on the back of the bus and then would come in the house of God on Sunday and take white gloves and fold a white sheet over a communion table. 
they're not worshiping it it helps them connect to him now what's key is respecting someone's temperament that's not yours and then secondly not imposing the entirety of your temperament on the entirety of the church to say a church needs to have a something for everyone but everything can't be about someone so in this house the intellectual doesn't judge the enthusiast but we don't let the enthusiast pressure the intellectual you run I'm gonna sit and I love him just as much you cried on that song I cried when they took it back but as long as God is being worshipped in spirit and truth that's what matters you got to cook because only you know your temperature and your temperament here's my prayer for this series that it is one of the most that it brings you into one of the most liberating seasons you've walked in spiritually where you are free from the pressure to practice this faith in a way that is inconsistent with the way your creator wired you what needs to happen is it needs to be done in spirit and in truth in a way that's aligned with your temperament and the father receives it so pray in the park or pray in the closet but he hears you Worship to gospel, worship the CCM, he hears you. Sit in a room and study the Bible or go on a walk and listen to it. As long as it's getting in you. No, pastor, we're supposed to read it. All right. Most of the early church was illiterate. Until the Old Covenant was written in Greek, the first Greek version of the Bible is called the Septuagint. Gentiles who didn't speak Hebrew couldn't even read the scripture. They had to hear it. But whatever your temperament is, the question is, are you doing it? That's what matters. Are you doing it? Because you got to have it. This is the season where you got to cook. Because this year is too stressful. It will be too stressful for us to have shallow spirituality. Lord, may my roots run deep. Lord, may we have the most genuine, authentic, liberating relationship with you. Lord, may I bring to you now my real self. I come to you now with no pretension. Ooh, we got to go, but I, God Almighty. But I come to you now, Father, with no pretension and no pressure. I actually feel accepted. I feel like you accept me. I realize there's nothing wrong with me. You just wired me different. And what you want from me is worship, praise, prayer, according to my wiring. So Lord, here it is. Right now, Whatever your way is, give it to him. Your way. Whatever your, hiya. I said, whatever your way is, give it to him your way. If you're a thinker, think. If you're a clapper, clap. If you're a hand raiser, raise your hands. Whatever your way is. Father, receive this. Come on, church.
Father, receive this. Receive this. This is me. This is the way you made me. This is the way you wired me. Shana,